The most defining moment of the 20th century was the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991. It formally ended 40 years of the Cold War. Remember, the Cold War was the defining feature, the one defining feature post the end of World War II. The old Soviet Union, it broke up. All the countries across its periphery from Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia in the western part that's in the Balkans, all the way to Ukraine and Belarus in the south. And of course, the Central Asian republics, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, etc., they all became independent countries after the fall of the USSR. Now, this was seen as a crowning moment. After all, the Cold War was not just a fight between America and the USSR, but it was also a fight between democracy and a closed system of governance. It was also a fight between capitalism on the one side and communism on the other. And eventually, it's open, free, liberal societies and that way of life which won, which led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. But one young man, who at that time was a KGB agent, saw these historic events with deep suspicion. And this suspicion made him view everything that America and its Western allies were doing as a conspiracy against Russia. That young man's name is Vladimir Putin. On Crux Decode this week, we go inside the mind of Vladimir Putin. Putin is on the cusp of what would be called an invasion of Ukraine. The US President Joe Biden says that his military and intelligence agencies have evidence that Russia is amassing over 100,000 troops just east of the Donbass region of Ukraine. Jake Sullivan, who is uh, the US National Security Advisor, he says Putin could walk in any day now. The question is this, what are Putin's motivations? Why would the leader of a country want to cause such mass destruction and unleash so much misery and pain to tens of millions of people, not just Ukrainians, mind you, but to also his own people, to Russians. Because after all, a protracted war with Ukraine is definitely going to hurt the Ukrainians, but more so, it's also going to hurt Russia and Russians. So why would a world leader want to put his own people to this kind of pain and misery? Now, to understand why he would go to such grave lengths, you need to understand and get inside the head of this one man, Vladimir Putin. What are his motivations and why is he playing this high-stakes game? In Putin's worldview, the fall of the Soviet Union was a conspiracy by America and its allies to claim victory in the Cold War. He's completely forgetting you know, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the Velvet Revolution, the entire set of countries that became that, that came out of the communist bloc uh, through the late 80s and early 90s. He's completely whitewashing all of that. He sees all of these countries, whether it's Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia on the, on the west of, uh, of Russia, or whether it is Georgia and Azerbaijan, all the way to Ukraine, and particularly Ukraine, he sees all of these as part of the great Russian motherland. Now, if you go back in history from the 15th, 16th century onwards, from the start of Tsarist Russia, from the start of the Russian Empire, all of these countries were part of the great Russian Empire. They were not independent countries. They were linked in many ways, historically, culturally, politically, economically, they were linked to Russia and it was part of the Russian motherland. And that's how Vladimir Putin views them even today. He doesn't look at any of these countries as independent countries. He doesn't see that their populations, in many cases through elections, uh, in many other cases through treaties, they wanted to become independent countries away from Russian influence, away from the Russian Federation. He completely discounts all of those people's revolutions and the agreements that happened, which led to the creation of these new independent countries uh, at the turn of the 80s and the 90s. Now, Ukraine is particularly sort of important for Putin because uh, it is where the Russian Empire began. There is huge historic, cultural, political and economic linkages between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, there are, even today, uh, lots of Ukrainians who are of mixed descent, who either have a father or a mother who are Russian and who are Ukrainian uh, from the other parent. 
Uh, if, for example, Mikhail Gorbachev, who was uh, the last president of the USSR, his mother was Ukrainian. So the way Vladimir Putin sees it, Ukraine is still very much a part of the heart and soul of the Russian motherland. And he's articulated this on numerous occasions, most famously back in 2007 at uh, the Munich Security Conference. Now, the Munich Security Conference is one of the premier platforms. Over the years, our presidents and prime ministers, some of the most influential heads of state have addressed the Munich Security Con Conference to outline what their security priorities are. And back in this conference in 2007, it was one of the first times that Putin was speaking uh, at the Munich Security Conference, he listed out three demands. Number one, no more expansion of NATO in Eastern Europe. Number two, NATO will remove all offensive weapon systems and uh, all proposals of new offensive West uh, weapon systems in Eastern Europe. And number three, going back to the Warsaw Pact. Now, the Warsaw Pact was what governed uh, America and its Western allies and Russia. It was basically a division of Eastern Europe into the Russian and Western spheres of influence. And the Warsaw Pact essentially uh, agreed, the countries who signed it agreed that they will not attack each other's spheres of influence. So that was one of the fundamental pillars of the Cold War. So in the 40 years after the end of the World War and all the way uh, down to 1991, the fall of the Soviet Union, you never saw any major wars in Eastern Europe because it was governed by the Warsaw Pact. So Putin, what he essentially wanted to do, and he said this in the 2007 Munich Security Conference, what he essentially wanted to do was simply to roll back to the Cold War days where Russia was not just caught in this uh, fight for military and, and, and political domination with the United States. Most importantly, at that time, Russia was viewed as an equal power to the United States. Today, that is not quite the case. And the problem is Vladimir Putin refuses to see today's reality. Russia's military today is not a patch of what it used to be back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, its economy is not even in the top 10. Uh, right now in 2022. But one thing that has not changed in the last 20 years, and if you go back and look at what Putin's demands are now, it is exactly what he articulated back in the 2007 Mu Munich Security Conference. Even though Putin's demands have been the same, and he's been hammering this again and again for the last 20 years, the West is responding in the same way that it has done for the last 20 years. Uh, and the outcome is pretty much similar, and that is Putin is getting his way. Now think about this for a second. In the last 20 years, the United States has had four presidents, from George Bush to Barack Obama to Donald Trump, and now, of course, Joe Biden. Russia, on the other hand, has only had Putin. And even though he was not president for a brief while uh, in the turn of the 2010s, he was still the man who was calling the shots. Make no mistake about it. So for the last 20 years, Russia has had only one ruler, de facto and de jure, and his demands are still the same. And the West still has the same response, which is to try and be more accommodative, to try and have dialogue. And there have been various versions of dialogue. Uh, Bush had a, a, an initial sort of uh, dialogue with him in the early part of the 2000s. Obama, of course, had the famous reset which never really reset any ties between Moscow and Washington. Uh, Donald Trump, of course, was seen uh, uh, famously as sort of a stooge of Russia. Therefore, there was no question of him standing up uh, to Putin or to Russia. And now Biden again is seemingly engaged in this endless negotiations uh, with Vladimir Putin. And the attempt is still the same, to try and see if a middle ground can be sought. Now, the problem is, if you look at Putin's demands, certainly they are maximalist demands, and the fact is, from those maximalist demands, you cannot find a middle ground. Because there is no way any multilateral organization, leave alone NATO, but any multilateral organization, would agree to a non-expansion of itself. The moment NATO says, okay, we are not going to expand into Ukraine or to other countries, which Russia thinks it is part of its sphere of influence, then Putin will start expanding to other countries in Eastern Europe, the ones who are already governed by these treaties. So there is no way NATO can agree to that primary demand which Putin seems to have, which is its non-expansion. Like I said, no organization would agree to its own non-expansion. So that brings us to a very fundamental question. Is this whole thing driven by 
Vladimir Putin's war monger. Is he a war monger? Well, the jury's out on that one. Maybe he is, maybe he's not. But I think a more accurate, a more appropriate analogy, and this is what you see from 2001 since he became president to now 2022, for the last 20 years, you look at all the moves he's made, the more appropriate analogy would be that of a gambler. He's playing a dangerous game of high stakes poker. Every time he raises the stakes high and says, I'm going to invade. In 2014, it was Crimea. Uh, in, the, uh, in the 2010s, there was military intervention in Georgia. And now, of course, uh, the threat is in the Donbass region of Ukraine. So every time he raises the stake by saying, I'm going to militarily in invade, the response from the West is the same pattern try to negotiate, find some kind of middle ground. Ultimately, what happens is that Putin becomes stronger. Now, think of it this way. What does a high-stakes gambler do? He doesn't necessarily have to have the better hand. All he needs to do is to convince you that he has the better hand. Thereby, he makes people fold and cave in to his demands. And that is exactly what Putin is doing. He's making the West believe that he has a better hand. That if today war were to happen in Ukraine, he's made the West believe that he is better off, his country is better off, his troops are better off than Ukraine or the rest of the Western allies. And the only way uh, to deter him from doing this, to break this pattern of behavior, is exactly what you would do with a high-stakes gambler. And that is to call out his bluff.